All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our, our last session for the quarter. Um, today is a bonus seminar day. We've got two hours here, so buckle up. We'll probably take a break in the middle because um, I always think on a, when a, in a two-hour session, getting a, a little break is not a bad idea. Um, I hope you don't go away after at the end of the break. Um, oh, it's usually in person classes. That's like uh, a little bit of a risk, like step out for a moment and then come back and half the class is gone. <laughs> but I hope you stick around. Um, and if you're uh, watching this on YouTube later, um, you know, that, that's also going to be an option. I guess that doesn't matter for me to say here because you're not going to hear me unless you're watching the video. Um, and anyone who is here is already here. So, um, but uh, we are, the plan for today is to talk over some more of the informal fallacies uh, since we're, this, this unit got the short end of the stick this quarter. Um, I want to try to just give some of the content and give you a, a peek into what, what's going on with this. And maybe um, just with today's class and with uh, Monday's uh, lecture, you'll have some framing for how to explore this curriculum on your own, which I, I've given you access to everything that we would have been looking at um, had we had time to do so. Um, and I do, I, like I said on Monday, I, I think this curriculum is super valuable and very helpful and worth your time to check out. And after the quarter is over, if you're doing that, maybe in the two weeks we now have where we're all self-quarantined before next quarter starts, that might be a great time to do that. Um, and I will be available as always. Um, in, and don't hesitate for any second on contacting me if you want to go over things. Um, if you're, Let's say you take a look at all the fallacies and try out those practice exams and want to talk about them, um, really happy to, to do that with you. So um, I think it's a cool cool curriculum, and I want you to have access to it. We'll get a little bit of uh, our feet wet with it today. I mean, with two hours, we can I think we can get through a good number of fallacies here. Um, and I'm going to be available, and I'm always here for you, no matter what, uh, going on into the future, uh, whether we're in class or not. So. Definitely wanted to reiterate that point, too. Um, <clears throat> so from Monday's class, I or Monday's lecture, I kind of was talking big picture about what's going on with fallacies, um, what their function is, uh, what we can do with them, um, the sort of attitude about how to approach thinking about them, like adopting that uh, once you got the empowerment of this lens to look through, what should you be doing with it? Um, and I wanted to just check in and see if if Monday's lecture had if you, if anybody had any leftover questions or hanging threads from what I was talking about on Monday, in terms of big picture framing, and then after that we'll get into some specific fallacies. Um, so what people in chat, uh, how did how did Monday's lecture go? So good. Woo. Cool. <laughs> uh did you you watched it later, Adrian? Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'll be taking care of that. Yeah, any any late video codes, I, I'll still be tracking. Very good intro. Okay, thank thanks, Josie. Happy to hear that's true. I'm not seeing anyone pop up with questions. Um, did did anyone have any questions? Just um, if maybe if you if it's true, you just say yes, and I'll we can wait here to hear about it. Well, thank you, uh, Jose and Adrian, for responding. Um, 
I do hope that people will uh, ask questions during this lecture as we go or, or get some discussion going about some of these. Um, maybe you remember from Monday's lecture, it's a big deal to me in covering the fallacies to talk about what to do in responding to them uh, when they do happen. Like ideally they don't happen. Uh, people are on kind of good behavior or using good reasoning. Um, and the debate is able to move forward productively. There's enough problems to sort out with controversial debates, especially in philosophy, um, on, on any important matter, without uh, getting into making things weirder by utilizing fallacies, right? So fallacies are kind of first order problems that if we can avoid those, we're gonna have plenty of other stuff to deal with. It's not like, um, this is something else I was mentioning on Monday, it's not a, as if if your argument is not guilty of any fallacies that it's a good argument. I mean, it's better than if it was guilty of fallacies, but even a non-fallacious argument can be weak. It can be uh, a phrase a lot of modern epistemologists like is defeasible. You know, it, it, it can be defeated by other argument. That can still happen. But ideally... Um, you know, dealing with any problems that are not based on fallacies is going to be much more productive. Uh, in fact, one of my um, advisors in grad school, uh, sort of giving us grad students advice about our participation in the world of philosophy, he was like, uh, don't be so fr afraid of being wrong, like giving a conference talk or publishing a paper and people just ripping it apart. He said, better to be interestingly wrong than trivially right. Um, so if, if we're not making mistakes that are on the basis of fallacies, uh, which are easily identifiable mistakes, they're just kind of almost like non-starters, arguments that use them, um, there, there still is the possibility of the argument being wrong, but any problems that it has will probably have, have a greater chance of being instructive or insightful. Um, failure is not always a bad thing. It can be extremely productive, especially any of you who who maybe have some more exposure to the uh, history of science can attest to that. Uh, there are tons of examples of where uh, a failure actually was a good thing, even though there's also kind of a concern on the radar for contemporary scientific communities that there's maybe a little bit too much emphasis on getting positive results and that negative results don't get as much attention, but sometimes they can be very, very valuable. Um, so. All right, well, let's let's uh, let's let's get past the big picture stuff and get into into some of the details then. Um, let me screen share. Share a window here. Let's go for this one. I'm going to kind of be hopping around here. Um, to go through as many fallacies as, as we can make time for and try to give you some of the highlights of, of some that I think are deserving of special note. Um, one really basic type of fallacy that you encounter all the time, um, and, and even, uh, I, well, yeah, let me put it this way. Um, many times there's a, oh, I just realized I'm going to do something here. Sorry, one second. I'm going to fix the video so that this makes a little bit better sense for people on YouTube later. I think I can get a little clever here. Mm -hmm. Try to find, there's probably a way I can have this video be, oh, maybe I can do it like, this. Oh, no, that didn't work. Hang on. Uh, ah, okay. Shoot. <clears throat> I want to put my face sort of in here <laughs> in the mix well, but I, there's not room for the video window and the Microsoft Word thing. Maybe like that. No, nah, this is not going to work. Okay. <laughs> it was worth a shot. Okay. Never mind. Okay. 
So, um, one of the fallacies, the, the fallacies can, be, some of them are nasty. I was mentioning that on Monday. <clears throat> some of them are, are, are abusive, uh, borderline abusive or just straight up abusive. But um, others are kinds of mistakes that um, are connected with basic cognitive biases that all humans are basically susceptible to. Um, uh, and maybe some special training can help with correcting those biases, but even with special training, um, they can still sneak up on people who are even trying hard to avoid those fallacies. Um, so some of these I, I would label as maybe more innocent, but the fact that they're more innocent, like they're not abusive, doesn't make them any less problematic in terms of their reasoning. And so there can still be things that we want to be looking out for. And <clears throat> this first category of fallacies is sort of a family of fallacies, the begging the question fallacies that's, that we I started in my selections. These very often fit into that category. Um, I can't tell you how many um, philosophers I've read their papers or books or something, <clears throat> and I know this person is not trying to argue in a fallacious way. Um, they're they're really trying super hard to shoulder their burden of proof, to anticipate charitably their opponent's objections, and all this kind of stuff, right? Really, really putting effort, sincere effort, at resolving something that is a matter of genuine rational controversy. But um, they they still end up falling into the trap of begging the question. And uh, so this can happen in a very innocent way. There's also ways in which it can be done maliciously, <laughs> like, like intentionally, um, to be um, sort of uh, for some kind of rhetorical effect or to try to like win the debate or something um, as like a sneaky tactic, although in my experience that's fairly rare. It takes a little bit of sophistication to intentionally use begging the question. What's more common, <clears throat> though, so um, if I if I do this, can you can you still see the um, the screen sharing, or does it go black when I do this? Just checking in with everyone. It's black. Okay. Um. When I what I'm doing is uh, bringing up the window that has my video, so people can see my face on um, on YouTube later. Are you able to see my face when it's like this? Is the video coming through right now? Can't see anything. How about if I do this? Can you see my video now? Mm -mm. Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, this will be a little more awkward then, but I'll do it. I'm going to kind of hop back and forth between... I, I don't want the whole video to just be staring at my Word document lecture notes, <laughs> so I'm going to swap back and forth between screen sharing while I'm talking. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, um, when I'm like watching a lecture video or something online, like on YouTube or something like that, being able to see a person's face while they're talking, I always find very valuable. Um, it just helps me. I, how many of you would say that's true for you? That you would it be valuable for me to be switching back and forth where you can like see me talk, or you don't care? Yeah, it is valuable to you, Parker. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. I'll I'll keep this even. If it's a little more awkward. A few more clicks on the mouse, but it'll be fine. Um. So, um. So there's I'm talking about a sort of what I've been describing is a range of cases where begging the question happens, and I know we haven't talked about what begging the question is just yet. But I, this is a dynamic that can happen for a lot of different fallacies because not all of them are abusive intentionally so or something. They're not all nasty. Some of them are innocent. But I was describing a range of like people who are trying hard to not beg the question who then still it might happen, right, despite their best efforts. And then there's some people who are maybe sophisticated enough to be intentionally doing this. Um, they know better, but they choose to do it anyway to try to like win the debate or something. But those are kind of fringe cases. There's a much bigger bunch, <laughs> a range, a set um, in between where people are not necessarily trying to do it intentionally, but they're also not taking a whole lot of steps to avoid it. Um, and so they fall into it much more easily. And because in a sort of intuitive way, even though they're not trying to be insincere, 
it does have a way of working in your favor if you're just trying to be persuasive. So you remember when I was describing that story before when I started teaching and I was getting student papers and I was like, oh my God, what's going on? Everyone's so in insincere because of the bullshit argumentative practices that you're, they're using. And then I was like, oh, okay, they're not really insincere. They're just like modeling what has been persuasive argumentative behavior to them in the past by others and are so commonly used, you know, things like that. I think that's what, what is the, that characterizes the much larger range of cases that are sort of in between those two extremes. Um, much more common for this to be happening. Um, so begging the question is a, a dangerous fallacy. It's uh, one of the more ubiquitous ones, and that's why I'm picking it out for special attention. I'm not talking about it just because it's first on the list. Uh, we've got 32 fallacies, and we're not going to be able to do them all today. So I'm going to pick and choose. But there's a reason for picking this one. So what is begging the question? Um, well, it's so interesting that, like I said, there's a whole family of them. There are four fallacies that are in this group, and I'm not going to talk about all their different uh, all the different, uh, more specific versions of it. I'm going to just kind of talk about the general phenomenon of begging the question and what's concerning about it. But the basic idea of begging the question is when an argument in trying to defend a conclusion is presupposing the truth of the conclusion as part of the logic for defending it. So the most basic way to beg the question is this kind of arguing in a circle phenomenon. This is true. Why? Because it's true. <laughs> the premise only counts if the conclusion actually is true, because we need all the premises to be true in an argument, right? Um, so the, the most blunt, ham-fisted way of begging the question on something is by just having the conclusion as a premise of the argument. Or when someone's like, I'm right because I'm right. Or the age-old refrain from parents, this happened to me when I was a kid, I'm trying really hard to not do it with my kid, but when my you know, the kid asks, why is that true, or why should we do that, or why is that right? And the answer from the parent is, because I said so, <laughs> right? Which might be a sophisticated argument uh, based on an appeal to authority or something like that, but it might just be like, I don't want to give you an answer. <laughs> it's true because it's true, now shut up, right? That kind of thing. Um, that would also be begging the question. But there's a, a lot of more subtle versions of this phenomenon that aren't as blunt force as just presupposing what you're trying to prove directly. One thing to keep in mind is that, especially because me, you've been getting advice from English teachers for a long time, that you should be making your writing more interesting by rephrasing points every time you use them. Sometimes the idea that is the conclusion shows up in the argument but it's reworded, so it may not be as immediately recognizable that it is the same claim as the conclusion. So that kind of version of even the kind of blunt arguing in a circle is something to watch out for. But here's the bigger issue, or the sort of deeper, more complex one. Say here's your position over, over on this side, and then over on this side is your opponent. What kind of arguments are you going to use to try to justify your position? And you can kind of imagine this spatially. What a lot of times people do is appeal to ideas, um, beliefs, values, if they were talking something like ethics or politics or some, something like that. Um, they appeal to um, support, rational support, that people who already agree with this position would be willing to accept. And politics is a really good example of this. Let's say you've got Democrats and Republicans, just to keep it simple here. Democrats and Republicans disagreeing on some particular policy, like whether this very particular policy should happen or not happen or something like that. And then the arguments that are offered for their respective positions, yes, we should have the policy, no, we shouldn't have the policy, that kind of thing. The arguments that get offered are the things that are part of the sort of constellation of beliefs that generally characterize those positions. And so when you hear like people on the media or doing interviews, like politicians doing interviews, and they're making the case for their for their position on, on maybe this policy issue or voting some way or another way, um, a lot of times the talking points are things that are already sort of familiar to people who are from a certain perspective. The people who are more likely to uh, defend that conclusion or that you know that position one way or the other. 
the quick way I can describe this, the TLTR here, is preaching to the choir. Right? Giving people the arguments that they're already willing to accept. But for people that are on the other side of that debate, that don't share all that those same background assumptions, that don't share this sort of constellation of beliefs, none of those arguments are really going to be super compelling. And this isn't just a matter of persuasion, but that there, there's going to be some kind of logical connection or dependency that uh, the, the, the acid test for question begging is, are the arguments that you're using to defend your conclusion only acceptable to someone who already endorses the conclusion? If they're, they're truly independent reasons, then yeah, maybe someone from the other side is not going to be as drawn toward them or as sympathetic to them, but it's not like embracing the, um, the premises has sort of, uh, it, that you could only find the logic in them if you already presuppose that the conclusion was true. Okay? That, that presupposition is the problem of begging the question. That's sort of the common pattern here of all the begging the question fallacies, all the different ways in which we can do it. The spirit, the, the like letter of the law is don't engage in circular reasoning. The spirit of it is don't preach to the choir, right? When you're making arguments, the most effective arguments are going to be those that appeal to independent reasons that someone who is uh, on one side or the other can acknowledge, right? To draw the person over to that side, or even better, working with the premises of your opponent's position and where they're coming from and showing the connection, the rational connections, the logical connections about how accepting those premises actually means they need to switch sides. They need to change their mind on this issue. Working on independent grounds or on your opponent's home turf are, are going to make the strongest arguments possible. And there are just going to be exception cases of this all the time. Um, it's not uh, question begging can't be reduced to just what people's uh, belief tendencies are or something psychological or sociological like that. But the spirit of it, I think, works this way. Trying to draw people over to your side rather than self-justifying, rationalizing yourself to yourself and waiting for other people to get on board with that. Like going out and reaching to them where they're at and showing the reasons why they ought to move around, right? To change their mind on something. That is the antidote to question begging. Charity is a major antidote to question begging, uh, adopting that kind of mindset. Um, so. Uh, oh, I wanted to say this earlier. Um, I got two two things on deck. I, I hope this is making sense. If you got any questions while I'm going, by all means, drop it into the chat as we go here. Um, but um, two I, two more ideas here. One is that uh, begging the question is, or this is question begging, or this begs the question, is a phrase that people misuse constantly. I wanted to say that right at the beginning, and I forgot to do that. Um, most of the time when people use this phrase in public discourse, they just mean that this raises a question. Like, if we accept this claim, then that raises another question, right? Um, something else to talk about. This is just saying, here's an issue that is conceptually, rationally relevant to another one. But that's uh, the technical use of begging the question is referring to this phenomenon of circular reasoning or presupposing what you're trying to prove. Um, that's that's the real concern. So that was one little thing. And then the last thing I wanted to, to make sure I, I got in here in my description is that maybe now with the description of question begging in a fuller sense, you can see why there's going to be this big range of cases where people are guilty of um, begging the question even without intending to, or even in the extreme case where they're trying very hard to avoid it actively and still fall into it anyway. And the reason is that what our beliefs are not this static, inert object. And, th and there's some deep philosophy behind this, uh, at least some stuff that's very compelling to me as a philosopher. But our beliefs are a p are not just, um, like, think uh, I got a subject, I'm, I'm a subject, and then I'm trying to understand some object. Here's an object. My truth-seeking efforts are not just all about the object. I mean, we want them to be, but the subjectivity of our ability to try to gain knowledge about the world, it is a subjective activity to be a true seeker, um, means that I need a way of looking. And we saw this really demonstrated in the inductive arguments, that making inductive arguments, evaluating inductive arguments always depends on background assumptions. 
for me to investigate, I have to work with some assumptions. So if I'm trying to prove some sort of conclu 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 conclusion about something, um, I'm, I'm going to be using some kind of lens, some subjective framework that's contingent and could have been otherwise in order to look at and understand this thing. So if I'm already trying to endorse a conclusion or defend or justify a conclusion that I already endorse, then that's probably going to color the way that I'm looking, right? <laughs> that's why we have the beliefs, is to inform the relationship we have with reality, of how to orient toward it, how to make sense of it, how to respond to it, especially when we're talking about ethics, right? Um, ethical beliefs, we're always going to be using those lenses. And when we come to the project of truth seeking, we're going to be using those lenses too. So it's very easy for someone to have their conclusion coloring the way that they analyze and come to a conclusion, to de in the defense of a conclusion. I said there's a lot of deep philosophy here because this has been grounds for some people being skeptics or rational fatalists, um, that the idea of there being a truly unbiased, objective, universal position to analyze from is bullshit. And I do not, uh, I do not follow those concerns to their conclusion. I'm not a rational fatalist or something like that, um, or what's sometimes called anti-realist. I'm not, I'm not in that boat. But I do think that those dangers are very real, and require a response. Um, that there's still the option for objective truth seeking, um, but it may not look the as straightforward as we might otherwise assume it to be. And I think a lot of the force of skepticism or fatalism here comes from just having, uh, like, finding out Santa Claus isn't real. You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> that, uh, you know, we have this um, presupposition of our ability to engage objectively and neutrally and in unbiased ways. And then when that is shown to be impossible, then it's like the sky is falling. And there are concerns. I don't think that they're fatal, though. But that's a deeper discussion, like I said. Big, big messy stuff about objectivity of rationality, true seeking, what we're in a position to be able to know, a bunch of big questions in epistemology. Kind of stuff that we have been teasing at a couple times during the quarter, but mostly avoiding. Um, and that's, uh, if you're fascinated with that, if you want to extend your education from this class, this class has not been designed specifically for philosophy majors, but there's a lot of connections with philosophy, and I'd recommend taking you know, a 101 class. Um, uh, it's certainly epistemology. I wish we offered an epistemology class at Bellevue College. We don't. Um, but there's uh, my 101 class definitely prioritizes these questions. Um, so there, there's some follow-up that you can absolutely do on this if you're curious. So how is this making sense with, uh, to everyone? Um, no questions have popped up in the chat as I've been talking. Um, any, anything emerging? Pretty clear? My explanation pretty clear? Cool. Awesome. Boss. All right. Um, let's go f and find us another fallacy to talk about. And by the way, if anyone has a fallacy, they're like, I really want to hear you talk about this one, Tim. By all means, throw it in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. This space is for us to just make the most out of, and, and I, I'm, I'm open to suggestions here. Okay. That's okie dokie, Andrew. All right, so, uh, yeah, we should probably do this one. Rationalization, one of my favorites. Let, let's start here looking at the lecture notes. Um, you're, you're getting the lecture notes up on the video? Yep, okay, cool. Okay, rationalization is a really, I mean, it's kind of a weird one to do next because this is a real outlier on the list of fallacies. This is a fallacy that's unlike almost any other on the list that I usually cover. So here's the definition that Edward Damer gives us. Using plausible sounding, but usually fake reasons, to justify a particular position that's held on other less respectable grounds. Um, and I say here in my lecture notes, there's a fine line between giving reasons and rationalizing, and that I think the book tries to make this seem more clear-cut than it actually or usually is. Rationalization um, is 
really a flaw of a person. Like I say here, it's usually just a problem of dishonesty or insincerity rather than a flaw with the argument. It's more about the attitude of the person arguing rather than the argument itself. So just looking at my lecture notes here, I say, if the argument is bad, it's bad. If it provides good reasons for the conclusion and a bunch of other things, then it's good. I mean, we've been trying throughout the quarter to detach ideas from people. I mean, this is going to be connected with another fallacy I absolutely want to talk about with you today, and that's the fallacy of ad hominem, when you attack people instead of their ideas. Ideas can be, the, the logic of an argument can be evaluated independently of the person providing it. And sometimes even insincere people or people are guilty of rationalization, of having this kind of character flaw, this epistemic vice, um, they can still provide really good arguments. And we don't have to somehow say that they're bad arguments just because we don't appreciate the character of the person giving it. Um, more on that in a second. Uh, but this can translate into bad arguments, having this kind of uh, dishonesty <clears throat> or insincerity can sidetrack the arguments themselves. Um, they can, uh, usually with avoiding something that is extremely relevant to the debate in, that we're having, um, so, so things getting swept under the rug or attention kind of being put in the wrong place. So that can be connected with uh, a violation of the relevance principle from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. Um, but this is really, really tricky um, to detect. So um, the, the two things that I want to really cover are exactly what is rationalization and how can you tell, and then what to do about it. There's a lot to discuss there. So the, the basic idea here, though, is that this is about about what's going on with the person and not the argument. So uh, kind of go back all the way to the code of intellectual conduct and the conversations we were having back then. Um, we wanted the, the goal of arguing as defined by uh, the code of intellectual conduct was, you know, there's the ethical consideration about we, while we're having these debates, we want to treat each other and ourselves ethically, justly. But we all, the main kind of goal or destination we're trying to get to is the truth or if we can't get to the truth the most defensible position on an issue and that's why things like being open-minded is so essential um, the goal is not to win the debate the goal is to get at the truth or to figure out what does it make the most sense to believe in it in this kind of open and fair sort of way and anything else Anything that's not, uh, remember the truth-seeking principle on the code of intellectual conduct, like the, the concern about ulterior motives that people can have while they're arguing, that uh, any, any of those ulterior motives are going to detract from getting the best chance of, of getting to the truth or to the most rationally defensible position, something like that. So uh, thinking about the intentions of people that are in the debate is pretty important. And character is related to that. Maybe you remember um, when I was sort of talking over the Code of Intellectual Conduct back at the beginning of the quarter, I was saying it's so tricky to make judgments about the violations of fallibility principle and truth-seeking principle because they're about people's attitudes and those are invisible to us. Um, it's very often that we aren't able to see what's really going on with someone or that we will only really have the evidence we need to get a sense of their sincerity after we're already like neck deep in the debate, right? Where there's the opportunity for that to kind of come out in the wash. Um, so that's the same thing that is a concern here with rationalization. I think rationalization, because of this, because of uh, how hard it is sometimes to pronounce judgment on whether someone is rationalizing that they have some ulterior motive with their arguing rather than the goal of truth seeking sincere truth seeking which again remember you can be a sincere truth seeker and be wrong <laughs> right? you can be trying your best to, to aim at the truth and still give bad arguments so having bad arguments doesn't mean you're insincere or something like that um, these are two different things the merits of an of ideas and arguments and the virtues the epistemic virtues of the person who's participating in the debate these are two separate things so because of these reasons about how hard it is to detect and make judgments about that I think uh, the real reason to study rationalization as a fallacy that we want to label and define and think about is mostly for ourselves, about trying to keep a check on our own motives, um, our own argumentative behavior, rather than as the main thing to be like blowing the whistle on other people about, right? Like we were, like I was talking about on Monday. 
So, uh, but there are going to be cases where that's absolutely relevant, and I want to give some advice about that too. But rationalization is really about the person. So, um, one of my favorite examples of this, uh, uh, demonstrating that kind of di uh, disconnect, uh, even though there sometimes are connections between attitude and, and the ideas that end up coming up, they can still come apart. A really good example is um, children. Children are still working on being sneaky. <laughs> you know, they're still mastering that skill. Adults are sometimes a little bit better at this. I think that definitely the older you get, the uh, more skill you have in deception. You just kind of pick it up as you go. Um, and for hiding insincerity. But children are much more transparent. And especially if you're just kind of wherever you're at in life, like if you have some more experience or more self-awareness um, or have some of these critical thinking tools to look through, then people who are not as far along on that path, their motives become much more transparent and easy to spot. I, I've noticed this as I've gotten older. Um, but even wherever you're at in your age, just think about some people who are like, I don't know, seven-year-olds or something, right? Seven-year-olds will think that they're being sneaky about something. Or even my, my three-year-old has sort of flirted with this a couple times. They think they're being sneaky and able to pull a fast one on you, and they're utterly transparent, right? Um, like they're trying to... I remember babysitting my cousins back when I was in high school, and they were trying to argue about why they should be allowed to stay up later than what my aunt and uncle told me was their bedtime. And they had all these arguments. And maybe you've had this experience with a kid arguing. You're like, I know that, you're, they, that the motivation for participating in the debate is not to figure out what's the most rationally defensible position or what's the ethical truth about what would be a just bedtime or something. You really just want to stay up, right? There's a very clear motive that's driving the argumentation and debate. And it's not some sort of sincere, objective, truth-seeking, cooperatively, or something like that. But even in the midst of that, even when their motives are utterly transparent, that it's still uh, easy to, to, or it would be possible, this has happened to me, they give an argument, and you're like, I'm not buying this. And then you're like, oh, oh, that's a pretty good point. Uh, you've got a point there. That's a nice try. You know, good argument. Um, even though you know you know, the jig is up. Like, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to stay up past their bedtime. They're, they're not gonna really going to persuade you to change it. But they might come up with some pretty decent-sounding arguments. Rationalizers are motivated. That's one thing that I think is always worth pointing out. Just because they have that, that sort of insincerity thing going on doesn't mean they aren't clever or intelligent and maybe even logical. That they might be able to come up with something that is a pretty good argument. And just because you can see through the motivation doesn't mean you need to dismiss what is a decent argument or good evidence or something just because you don't like the person giving it or you don't like what they're going to do with it. And that's always something we got to be careful about. I was talking with one of my old grad school buddies yesterday, catching up with um, while taking a break from grading. Um, I hadn't talked to him in a long time. Um, and he, we were talking about all sorts of stuff related to political philosophy because I was teaching political philosophy for the first time this quarter. Conversations went in this direction. And he was talking about how he noticed um, in his students and just in sort of culture in America generally how after um, sort of some conservative or more like libertarian um, political perspectives have really latched on to this idea of being critical thinkers, that some progressive people are like against critical reasoning now, all of a sudden, right? That they they don't like what these people are doing with it, um, and oftentimes there's plenty of problems with claiming like only critical thinkers are the people who are going to believe this perspective or something, as if there's no room for real rational disagreement. Um, but because there was something that was considered incorrect or distasteful about the association of this thing with this other thing that they stand against, they just toss the whole thing and start abandon, abandoning good tools of reasoning and argumentation. Um, and one of our, actually a, a, a guy who graduated from the program that he and I both went to for grad school, wrote a book about this. Um, I think it was uh, Logic for Lefties or something like this. Um, uh, trying to combat this tendency in the progressive left to abandon critical reasoning standards as a, a in, in defense of their position. He's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, does that example make sense?
Maybe you've noticed some some of that kind of phenomenon too. I see that kind of hap I've some evidence for it from time to time. Yeah, yeah. So um, rationalization, sticky. All right. Uh, do you feel like you got a pretty good idea of what it is? I want to talk a little bit about uh, what to do about it um, before we take a little break here. Okay. Any any questions popped up or just things that you've been thinking about or uh, want to comment on with what I've been throwing down so far? I'm seeing nothing pop up. <laughs> All right, I'm going to throw up a screen sharing here for one more second. Um, you can look at the comments that I've got. You know, I mentioned on Monday that I like to uh, have advice for what to do about these fallacies when they appear. Um, and uh, just, uh, again, to make this little connection um, before I get into this, if someone is rationalizing and they're just looking to win the debate, then there there is going to be like selective attention. Um, not every anything that is hurtful to their position will be avoided, and advantages to their opponents will be avoided. They'll try to redirect attention in a way that paints their position in the most favorable light. Like that's one of the expressions of that insincerity that's very common. Um, and the book has some advice. Edward Damer's got some advice for what to do. Um, but the the first level of defense I'd if you if you're in a debate with someone and it seems like they're they are just interested in winning they're not approaching this as a cooperative sincere true seeker kind of thing the first thing that I would do if you're suspicious of this or maybe if you're like no that's definitely what's going on I don't have any questions about this whatsoever just go go like Socrates on this be aloof um, don't call them out don't point the finger at them don't try to call uh, you know drag them out on the carpet or something, but just bring up whatever they're ignoring. And <clears throat> like I say here, doing this innocently without accusing your partner of dishonesty, even if they are dishonest, gives them another opportunity to be honest without any loss of face, right? without any embarrassment or public shaming or something like that. Okay, And this is, uh, this is useful, I think, because the accusation of insincerity is not usually met with sincerity. <laughs> you know, if the person is already in that boat, then calling them out on the carpet for for not being an objective, fair truth seeker is probably not going to get very far. If the debate is already on the skids um, because there isn't this cooperative sincerity going on, then that accusation could just destroy it entirely. Like all opportunity for the discussion moving productively insincerely forward may just be completely lost at that point. A lot of times when people are uh, are so concerned about these matters, like these kind of insincere motives, and they are in danger of losing face because of an accusation like this, they will double down on their bullshit. And that's not, you're not going to be able to call them over to the light <laughs> by doing it this way. Now that that's not the only consideration here. Um, but I, I think there's, this is a tactic I've used many, many times, and with good effect, um, in opening up more opportunities. Um, there are certain cases under which I wouldn't do it, uh, or I wouldn't consider it the right thing to do to orient that way about it. Um, there, there is some downsides to this approach, but I, I think, and it's not foolproof, it doesn't work every time, but if you're thinking this person is someone who could maybe be capable of this, then giving them more chances to to kind of do to to do the right thing um, and to just uh, you know present that opportunity to them not not you know kind of modeling it right um, that you're like okay this person is really operating in an insincere way but I'm just going to pretend as if they are sincere to treat them as better than they actually are can sometimes encourage them to live up to the perception that you're projecting of them. Um, and without having to, 
to do anything like a public apology or anything like that. So I think this technique is great. I mentioned it's Socratic because Socrates is doing this all the time. He's like letting people hang themselves on their own rope. He doesn't need to call them out and make it into a fight. Uh, he's just If he just keeps pursuing the truth and keep directing the attention where it needs to go, um, sooner or later they will either have to participate in that sincerely and engage with those things directly or reveal their insincerity much more explicitly. A lot of Socratic dialogues um, have this kind of narrative shape to them. Okay, but if that doesn't work, if they continue to do this song and dance to avoid or dismiss this important issue, as I say, you have a greater sign that they are not really interested in having an argument and are more preoccupied with something else. Like maybe struggling with emotions. And this is another thing that I want to add on to the book's contribution and why I think this is important to talk about, why I, why I prioritize this fallacy for us today. Um, I do think the book is a little cold. Um, sometimes it's completely understandable that a person is incapable of approaching a true-seeking debate with that sincerity because there's something else preoccupying them, like maybe struggling with emotions or, or something else, right? There's all sorts of things that limit our bandwidth, um, things that um, we're not we're not really set up, or this isn't the right time, the best we're not in our best mode for being able to do something that's really difficult. Like I was talking about the beginning of the quarter, I think rational debate is incredibly confronting, um, and asks for all of our strengths to to really execute on it um, the way it deserves. And sometimes we're not in our best mode for that. And so if, if your conversational partner is not in a position to, to engage in that activity productively, I think forcing the issue or chastising them is foolish <laughs> and unproductive. It's not going to get anywhere, and it just makes things harder relationally. Um, I, as I've, I've shared this slogan with you before, sometimes people don't need an argument, they need a hug or something else, right? Some other kind of non, non-rational device or resource. And I say I hear I, I can't emphasize this enough, right? How important it is to be tracking this, that we're not just rational beings here, and our choices are not just a matter of us intentionally choosing insincerity and evil over sincerity and truth and goodness and all all the positive stuff. Um but I, if this is happening, then I'd say, same time, you know, out of compassion for them and or for whatever understanding for whatever they're dealing with, that doesn't mean that you should be treating what are bad arguments as if they are good arguments or something like that. Um, whatever they're doing as part of the rationalizing activity can't necessarily be respected. Even if you respect the person and... Um, avoid something like public shaming them for this or something. But you know, m more often, what I think is the right answer for these situations is to just take a time out. Be like, maybe we don't need to have the debate right now. Instead, I, you know, if it's me here, uh, what I usually do is I try to figure out like what else is going on here. Like maybe we switch the conversation topic. Um, this has happened many times where I've had a conversation with someone I really know well or like a student I barely know where I'm like, my radar's up, you know, empathy radar's deployed, and I'm like, something goofy's going on here, right? It's sometimes rationalization itself, like having the alarm bells going off for rationalization is all it takes for me to be like, yeah, there's something, something else is going on that it's not like I'm not getting the full picture here of what's happening for the person. Maybe a little time out here, just checking in with the person, be like, what's happening for you? You doing okay? Um, and sometimes the a little bit of compassion and empathy, empathy there goes a long way. Um, for one thing, oftentimes in my experience, people are just so thankful <laughs> and have gratitude for it. You're like letting them off the hook of something because they're not really feeling great about doing this activity at this moment um, and to give them a little gracious space about it. And sometimes taking that little time out, checking in, reconnecting, then does open up the ability to go into the debate and now pursue it productively. Once they've been seen or heard in that or uh, joined in that position and it's not being held as a secret or there's understanding, a lot of times when we get into debates we're so used to people being abusive that's like we have to defend ourselves from attack all the time. 
And it doesn't have to be like that, right? It can be this cooperative project of truth seeking together. But if people are bracing for that, then anything that can be done to, to remove the obstacles um, should maybe happen first. And it's like some you got other time. Maybe there's a better time to have that debate and have that discussion to give it the chance of being productive. So I think this kind of understanding is an important um, thing to add it to the tool set as part of the context for using the tool set of critical thinking and debate and rationality um, to recognize it can have these limits. And actually for the sake of productive debate towards the truth, it might be important to have sensitivity to these other matters too. I definitely though am concerned or I, you know, balanced with these considerations of compassion are the concern of sacrificing the truth for the sake of smoothing things over sort of relationally or being nice or something like that. That I don't think is, I don't have very much respect for that. Um, there can be many cases in which uh, even if it's difficult, even if it's tough, um, maybe we can't put off this debate towards some other time that is more convenient. We are uh, studying um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail in my political philosophy class today, and that's one of the things that he talks about in the letter. He's like, we have to force this conversation. It's not going to be fun. It's, it's going to involve conflict um, to own up to or recognize um, the injustices that are taking place in our society. Um, but it, it, there's no, no more time to wait. Uh, he says, we've been told to wait forever, <laughs> right? Every time is always not the right time. And, and sometimes it is appropriate to force it, that it needs to happen even if there are these barriers. It's like, well, we have to go into it anyway. I do think even in those circumstances, there's a way for you and the other person to get on the same side of that by just acknowledging it instead of pretending like this is just a straightforward rational debate that's so easy to engage in. Um, but to acknowledge it is going to be difficult, it is going to be messy, there's going to be a lot of other noise, um, but we need to, you know, be bold and have good courage and go for it anyway, right, and, and hash that stuff out. Also, rationalizing gets used for all sorts of insincere purposes that maybe don't deserve as much accommodation, like um, maybe you've known someone or been friends with or have a family member, someone who just can like never take responsibility for anything. They're just, it's not possible for them to be held to account for anything. And that can be really dangerous. When people want to use rationalization as a way to avoid punishment or accountability, that might not be the time to be like, oh, okay, all right, well, I know this is tough for you, so maybe we can talk about this some other time. Or, you know, there, there are some times where the arguments have to be dealt with, um, and there's, there's stakes involved with that. So those little caveats to the side, I do encourage quite a lot of um, extra rational compassion as a way of setting up the debate for having the most success, if that makes sense. So um, some advice, some tips from my experience, do what you will with it. Um, these things, human sincerity and insincerity is an incredibly difficult problem, and I don't think in 10 minutes I'm able to solve that problem entirely. But maybe the, those are some things to think about. Any, any questions about all that? I'm, I don't know what you're thinking about what I'm throwing down. Hello? No, nothing? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, so far? All right. You are very free to criticize my advice. <laughs> or to add to it or, or whatever else. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking taking a little break is a good idea for a two-hour session. Um, so I, we're about to do that. Although I wanted to do, I wanted to mix things up a little bit for today's session in terms of the the uh, the C O D E <laughs> to try to deal with the Google searching here. Um, there's going to be two of them, and I'm going to give one now, and I'm going to give one later. So uh, when I ask for the C O D E uh, on the Q U I Z. Uh, on Canvas, um, <laughs> I don't need to spell out everything. Um, 
you'll you'll ask uh, you'll have to put two things down. Okay, so part one of the skeleton key is um, no, I don't know. What was I reading about before at class today? Um, oh, okay, okay. It'll be a it'll be a two part here. Okay, this is great. I got this awesome new board game that I cannot play right now, uh, but I'll I'll play it. Once I'm on break, it's very. It's from a designer who likes to do really super high theoretical, philosophical board games. Um, so the first piece of the skeleton key is trans. Does it make sense, chat? What I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm up to, the game I'm playing today. There's going to be two pieces. Mm -hmm. There's the first piece, trans. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, let, let's take a little break, and we'll be back in like 10 minutes.
All right, we're back. Oh, no, I, I left the recording going. Dang it. Sorry to those of you watching this on YouTube. Um, hopefully you're able to skip through that and it wasn't too much of a inconvenience. Okay. Um, let's go... Let's see. What other fallacies? Hey. Let's see. Let's... Um, There's a, there's so many good ones here. Um, I think a lot of these, uh, if you're following along in my lecture notes here, um, a lot of these uh, fallacies that are in the relevance, uh, under the relevance category, especially the fallacies of a relevant appeal, are um, probably pretty familiar. Like appeal to common opinion, um, appeal to force or threat, uh, appeal to tradition, Appeal to self-interest, manipulation of emotions. These are these are ones that I would expect that you have some familiarity with. There's some cool things to unpack about them, though. Maybe I will talk a little bit here about appeal to self-interest. Um, I think this one is important. So I'm, I'm not going to screen share here. I'll just read to you the definition. Appeal to self-interest, uh, definition we get here from Edward Damer is urging an opponent to accept or reject a particular position by appealing solely to their personal circumstances or self-interest when a more important issue is at stake. And that little caveat at the end is important because um, sometimes what is at stake is just the person's, you know, well-being, their own, you know, their their interests are what's the most thing that is important. And then to address that directly is not doing something irrelevant. Um, you know, you're, you're right on topic, right? There, that's, that's the thing to be discussed. Um, but the thing that's noteworthy about this is that appeal to self-interest is, when it is problematic, is problematic in the same way that something like appeal to force or threat is. Um, bullying someone, threatening someone to uh, accept your conclusion is giving irrelevant reasons for the conclusion. Um, and I, if we we're doing this like as a, the, preparing you for the exam, I would have warned you about how these two fallacies are easy to confuse with each other. Um, and the main difference between the two of them is that in appeal to force or threat, the person who's giving the argument is the source of the concern. But in appeal to self-interest, they may not be the source of the problem. They're not the ones threatening you. They're just pointing out how something is in your best interest to endorse or believe or to act on when that may not be the most important stuff to be talking about. But they're both similar because they are both appealing. They're, they're kind of like... Um, uh, manipulation of emotions. Manipulation of emotions is a big general fallacy that can have more specific instances that overlap or count um, with some of these other more specific patterns. Um, so appeal to force or threat, bullying, is trying to exploit fear <laughs> right, as a motivator. Self-interest is trying to um, exploit selfishness um, and the motives that people have to be self-interested, even and over and above, maybe other considerations that um, are maybe ethically or morally more compelling. I talked about this a lot. Maybe we maybe we touched on this at some point during the quarter. Uh, I think I might have um, think back way to the beginning of the quarter again, the first lecture we had, when we, we were trying to define what arguments were. That um, in an argument uh, is about giving support for the conclusion. But we are looking for a very particular kind of support. Do you remember? Um, sorry, I got a sneeze coming. Ugh, allergy season. Um, thank you. Um, so you remember my distinction between a reason to think something is true versus a reason to treat it as if it was true. Like that distinction between, as like a sincere, rational justification for something, uh, or um, a, a, a rationalization, kind of like we were talking about a second ago, um, an insincere appeal. Uh, oh, Jose, you can't see me? Uh, did my video cut out? I don't think I'm screen sharing anymore. Yeah, 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 I'm not. Oh, you can see. Okay. It, maybe it's just a bad connection, Jose. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm lagging for a second. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, appeal to self-interest or appeal to force or threat are both substituting 
reasons with motives. And that's the basis on which they're problematic. But I might have talked about this scenario when we discussed that before, of democracy, how, how oftentimes democracy happens uh, in America today. Where if someone's trying to like the I did does this ring bells? Do you remember me talking about um, the spirit of democracy? I, I'm fine repeating it too, but I don't know if, I'm, if everyone's like, yeah, I heard this one before. Not ringing bells or okay. I'll I'll uh, I'll just go for it. Uh, stop me if you've heard this one before. Um, so. A lot of time, uh, or let's start here. Part of the idea of democracy is to have decision making um, diffused by everyone in society, with the goal of eliminating, at least in part, one of. The, there's a lot of reasons for democracy, but one reason is to eliminate arbitrary decision um, and the kind of the kind of arbitrariness that's involved in, say, corruption, right? If you've got a monarch, if, think of like John Locke talking about uh, democracy as a uh, an alternative to the monarchy system um, in Europe. If you're if you're worried about uh, a monarch or a monarchical system, it's that someone's given all the power and they can just do whatever they want with it. There, there's no accountability for that. But if you have democracy, then if some decision is going to get made, then people have to be convinced. That it's the right thing to do. This is in theory, right? So uh, a lot of uh, political philosophers who really try to give this defense of why democracy is socially just, this kind of thing, appeal to the the way in which um, it will vitalize or make more robust public discourse and decision making or di more robust decision making through public discourse, that I'm going to have to convince a lot of my peers on these things that we have disagreements about. We'll have to present the arguments to get their votes, and then the best position will be the one that's chosen. Now, even even the, the like early liberal philosophers who really argue in this way for democracy are no dummies to how it can be subverted or... Um, oh, cool. Awesome, Jose. Um, how it can be subverted or problematized. I mean, they're, they're savvy to that. But this is the dream. This is the hope. And one of the big ways that it does get subverted, that you, we see in contemporary times, where when someone's trying to get your vote, um, they may try to give the reasons, right? Like we can, part of the reason we need to talk about it is that when it comes to matters of social justice and what's good for everybody in society, we can have disagree reasonable disagreements about how it's supposed to look. And maybe we do engage with it substantively as objective truth seekers, you know, sincerely trying to figure out what is really the best decision. Let's, let's hash out all the ideas and arguments and figure it out. But oftentimes it doesn't happen. And instead, the way people try to get your votes is by showing you that you benefit from this decision. Um, this is the most extreme version of this in my mind is the kind of micro-targeting of advertisements that we saw in the last election, the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal thing that happened where um, metadata was being used basically through sociological technology to figure out how to get people to move on certain issues in a way that's targeted to their specific demographic or to like build coalitions of voters based on what is going to be in their self-interest. Instead of trying to convince people about what is like universally the right thing to do, what would be universally just, or what would be universally beneficial, they're like, well, we can get the support of people if we create policies that just get enough people to make that the majority that gets voted for. So when people argue this way with you, they're oftentimes guilty of appeal to self-interest. Even if I stand to benefit from a policy, it may not be the right policy for society. And I might not need, I shouldn't be voting for it, even if I'm the one who would stand to benefit from it, that there's a self-interested reason for me to do so. Um, there are so many issues I can just say personally. Um, I stand on one position or another, not because it's in my self-interest, but because I believe it to be the thing that is good overall for everybody. That it, even the, if I take a hit on this, there's some sacrifice for me personally, 
um, or that I'm just not in the best possible position I could be in, it's still the right thing to do. It's still the right way for how things ought to operate. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I, I think of the, the, the setting here, this example of um, modern democracy and how it can go one of these two different ways as a really good illustration of what we'd have in mind with a concern about something like appeal to self-interest. When there's more important issues at stake other than just me, then we need to take those into consideration and to only appeal to what's in someone's self-interest is not a sincere way to argue. This is not going to be a good argument. It'll be fallacious. It's not like the entire government exists to benefit you personally, right? Um, there's m more going on than just you, and your decisions don't have to be restricted to just your own personal self-interest. There's a deeper philosophical tangent on this as well, about the nature of rationality. This is a topic I get into in my ethics class toward the end of the quarter, about what does it mean to have a good reason to do something. And there is, there has been a... Um, a traditional uh, historical philosophical view that says the paradigmatic example of good practical reasoning is to do things in terms of your self-interest and to do anything else is irrational for you to do to, to define self-interest to define rationality in terms of self-interest um, some philosophers do this like Hobbes definitely does this um, Hume has his own like weird version of it that's very very similar um, but that that is uh, that's a kind of stance that I take major issue with, and a, and a lot of philosophers have, and trying to expose um, this uh, faulty premise that um, rationality is purely just a matter of self-interest. That's that all that's all there is to it. So all arguing is really just selling, and I don't think that that's true. And uh, this fallacy stands against that. That's part of what we are committing to with that being a fallacy. Um, is that making sense? How's that going for everybody? Sorry you lost your connection, Parker. Good from what you got, yeah. Well, this will be on YouTube, too, if you want to go over and, and get, get what you missed. Okay. Um, so that was a cool one to go into. There's all these little logical ones that are fantastic, too, that I like, but... Um, we're going to skip over those. Uh, unrelated question. Uh, were all fallacies we recognize today put forth by Aristotle? No. Um, Aristotle uh, does like to categorize some of these things or collect them. He has a collection of these that he will speak that he speaks to, but he's not the only one. Um, <clears throat> other other ancient philosophers also um, were tracking this kind of thing, and and sometimes. Um, they weren't uh, necessarily labeled, but the patterns were being recognized and, and, and exposed and utilized as a course of argumentation. Um, finding patterns to arguments is, is not something that's just, just Aristotle's province, but Aristotle is one of the earlier philosophers who really tries to build a logical system, like a formal logical system. Uh, even the formal logic that we studied in our um, little crash course with uh, on it with chapter six um, is very it's a very different and evolved version of Aristotle's logic but it, it, it has that as part of its sort of historical and theoretical foundations um, so there there's a reason why Aristotle gets connected with these things but um, so many of them were not uh, tracked by Aristotle explicitly um, a lot of them are though yeah, especially the, the more basic ones that uh, are more commonly acknowledged or affirmed. Yeah. There's a bunch of uh, specifically logically, uh, formally based fallacies that are definitely in Aristotle's wheelhouse here, like affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, which we talked about, I think, really briefly when we did conditionals before. Um, those are definitely from him. Yeah, good question. Okay. Um, with the time we got left here... I really want to make sure we do two more fallacies that you probably have heard before, but they're just, they're really, if I was going to be presenting this uh, in, the, in the way I'm doing it today, or just we get to do a few of them, um, I definitely would talk about these. Is ought fallacy is a really important one, but we've already talked about that at times before in the class. The, the gap between descriptive and normative claims uh, is a big one, and we can... 
we can kind of fall off the boat here in two ways. Uh, we can think that because something is the case, it ought to be the case, which is uh, the main sort of problem with the is-ought fallacy, which is kind of like um, uh, just n not recognizing that things can be happening and they might be not good, <laughs> right? Or something might not be happening that ought to. Uh, and if we if we really just define um, ought in terms of is, then there's really no basis for critical evaluation of any kind. Uh, the whole idea of the normative is lost entirely. It gets completely collapsed into the descriptive. Um, it doesn't require this, but uh, you know, identifying that as a problem, I, I might talk about in terms of like fate. Like if you're using a, a really robust life paradigm that says everything that does happen is what ought to have happened, even if it doesn't seem like that. Um, that could be a, a version of the is-ought fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy is a version of this, uh, where you assume that because something is natural, it's good, or just because something is artificial, it's bad, and that doesn't follow. Um, but the other, the other way works too. Just because something ought to be the case doesn't mean that it will be the case. And that's wishful thinking, and that's a fallacy that probably everyone is familiar with. Wishful thinking is like bad reasoning. But it, it goes the other way too. You know, just because something ought to be the case doesn't mean it will. That's wishful thinking. But just because something is the case doesn't mean it ought to be the case. Adrian asks, what evidence is there against the deterministic is-ought fallacy? What do you mean evidence? Or I guess I'm confused on both parts there. Um, the deterministic is-ought fallacy. Is ought there used in a more ethical sense? I think maybe you're touching on free will issues. I mean, ought is ethical. Ethics is just about oughts. Ethics is about the normative. What would be ideal? Good and bad, right and wrong. There, there's a big philosophy tangent to get into here. Sure, yeah, go on, go ahead. Yeah, use your mic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let me let me uh, share this for everyone who's on YouTube who wasn't able to hear what you said, Adrian. So, in philosophy, there in metaphysics, there's a debate about whether this thesis of determinism is true, or what's sometimes called, like you said, hard determinism, Adrian. Um, and the the thesis of determinism is that everything that does happen in reality, um, like all causal events are perfectly determined. That is, if you take a prior state of affairs of the universe, add to that the laws of nature, there is only one result that can happen. So instead of sometimes the way we imagine that the world could have gone in all these other ways, the determinist sees reality as on rails. There's only one path. The only thing that's possible is what actually happens. Every event is determined by the prior circumstances, the prior events, coupled with the laws of nature. That's the thesis of determinism. And this is hostile to very traditional notions of free will, that when you act a certain way, you could have done otherwise. That's the most classical definition of free will. There's a whole lot of other things going on in this debate. I mean, this is a big, big topic, and I'm not going to be able to exhaustively handle it. But uh, to answer what I think you're curious about, Adrian, there is still the possibility of affirming the is-ought gap, basically, that we shouldn't confuse is with oughts, even under determinism. So even if the world had only one way it could ever have been, and it's the way it actually is, and we don't have free will, and we don't have the ability to do otherwise, what do you lose? Well, you do lose, potentially, this has always been the threat of the debate in philosophy and why it's such a big debate, you might lose moral responsibility. So you can't hold people accountable for any of their actions in the way that you normally would under the logic that they have a choice and they made the wrong one, right? That they could have done the right thing, but 
they in fact did the wrong thing and so now they're subject to punishment or some kind of accountability or judgment. Um, so you might lose that. You lose moral responsibility. But you don't necessarily lose the idea that something would have been better. Even if those other possibilities were never going to happen, you you can still say it's a tragedy that things worked the way that they did or that it was a good thing that they worked the way that they did. Even if there was no real chance for anything different to happen, there's still the whole space of logical possibilities. Um, let's say, you know, coronavirus like had this big outbreak and and people have been suffering because of it. Even if this was always destined to happen and that there was no way anyone could have avoided it and everything was on rails, you can still say it's a tragedy. I mean, you don't have to say that it's somehow good just because it had to happen. Right? So does that answer your question, Adrian? A little bit? I mean, the, the, the word ought is really not supposed to be loaded with any kind of conceptual baggage other than the normative, what is better and worse. And um, someone being guilty or innocent of wrongdoing is connected with moral responsibility. But things just being good or bad, like more ideal or less ideal, does not require a space of moral responsibility. Even, yeah. if, even, if, even if someone like... Um, inadvertently did something harmful, the fact that it was inadvertent or they weren't deliberately choosing it doesn't stop it from being harm. Okay. Um, let, let, let's, let's get to these other two fallacies that I wanted to discuss here. Uh, and maybe there's so many good ones. I love this whole list of things. It's so sad having to skip some. Um, okay. The, there's two, there's two big, um, Two big fallacies left. They're, these are kind of the highlights that I think if uh, you watched a YouTube, a five-minute YouTube video on informal fallacies, these two would almost certainly get mentioned. They're they're two of the nastier ones um, and really common and uh, pernicious and all those things I was describing on Monday's lecture of like why we even identify fallacies in the first place. These are two really obvious candidates for things we'd want to be tracking. One of them is the aforementioned ad hominem fallacies, which is Latin for against the person. Um, so it's when you're attacking a person instead of their ideas. And there's a whole way, bunch of ways you can do it. This one is another one that has like a family of fallacies. There's the general pattern of abusive ad hominem. And then there's some more specific ways we do this, like uh, what about ism, to the two wrongs fallacy, and uh, poisoning the well is another really interesting one. So ad hominem is one of the ones I'd like to talk about. And then attacking a straw man is the other one. These are, the, these are the really two big ones. Um, and my guess is many of you, uh, I would do a show of hands here if we were in person, of like who's heard these fallacies before. Um, but just in case you haven't, they're, they're definitely worth us touching on here uh, with our remaining time. Um, Andrew, I see you've got something you're typing here. I'll try to point out some things that... Um, uh, sometimes get overlooked too about these fallacies in how they get presented quickly, perhaps. Good review, cool. Mm -hmm. Would ad hominem include character defamation? Um, I've heard of this one, but no other. Okay, so uh, let's talk about that uh, as a part of this. So the general pattern of, of, of ad hominem attacks are that the person who's giving the argument is there's some personal attack on them as a way of dismissing what they have to say. So we talked about this earlier with rationalization, that there's a difference between the person and the arguments that they're providing. Maybe you remember way back at the beginning of the quarter when we did the Code of Intellectual Conduct, I talked about like the table of the debate, and we come to the table of the debate, and we drop cards on the table of the debate, and then and sort things out, and then we dismount, right? So there's a difference between me, the human being, with all the shit I got going on, and then the ideas that I put onto the table of the debate. And those can be evaluated independently of the person providing them. Um, oftentimes we do want to know things about 
the person who is making a case for something. And that might be relevant for some things, but the arguments themselves that are being offered may have merit independently. If we look at the concepts involved with that, the uh, conclusion being advanced on certain premises, even if the person is an insincere asshole, they could have a good argument. Kind of like we were talking about earlier with rationalization. Just because someone's got a character flaw going on doesn't mean they might not make some good arguments. And this is almost a, this is another slogan I often say. I probably have said it to you before that, like, in my experience, one of the most frustrating things about assholes is that sometimes they're right. You know, we don't want to agree with them, but they may um, they may actually have something legitimate to offer. Oh, am, am I lagging? Everything's frozen. Oh no! Come on, we're right at the end here, internet. Come on. Oh, make it through. Maybe I'll give it a second here and see if it reconnects. All right, I think I solved it. Um, all right, so what was I talking about? Uh, oh, right, uh, about ad hominem attacking people instead of their ideas. Um, so, yeah, even people who have major problems with them, you know, they're compromised, they're corrupt, they are assholes, they are bigots, they are whatever, right? Um, uninformed, blah, 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 blah. In some ways, we can detach them from what they're offering. Imagine, like, if you got, uh, you get an argument from someone who you think has these personal flaws. Imagine taking the words that they said and just putting them in the mouth of someone you've got respect for. What would you think of the ideas then? I mean, I think part of the deeper stuff going, there's two things I like to point out here, and there's a bunch of other things, but I'm going to prioritize two things for the time we got left here today. One is that um, oftentimes I think we do make decisions about what arguments we buy and which ones we reject based on what we like, whether we like the person or not. If we have respect for the person, we're more sympathetic to their ideas. If we don't respect the person, then we're less sympathetic to their ideas. And I think that's a that's a kind of bias that we have to take steps to to combat. And a really great way for doing that is to just take the argument and imagine putting it in someone else's mouth um, and see you know how and compare that against them, right? Um, but this is a major technique of, of critical thinking, is to try to combat these types of biases, and that's a big one. Um, the other thing I'd like to say about uh, sort of a observation about how the ad hominem fallacy goes is that um, though there's one exception case. So, and this is kind of something that you're motioning toward, Andrew, earlier in the chat, that if um, there's a there's a kind of argument in which attacking me personally is absolutely relevant. Like the the ad hominem fallacy is a fallacy of irrelevance as much as it is abusive, um, because it's like the wrong the tension in the wrong place. It's a red herring argument, right? The idea is the thing to evaluate, and you're talking about the person instead. That's not the idea. But what if I am a part of the argument? What if I'm on the table of the debate? And this is possible when I make an argument from authority where I cite myself as the authority, right? If I do that, if I'm saying your reason for believing something is because I believe it and I'm a trustworthy source, now attacking me is relevant. I'm, I'm a part of the target, right? Now attacking me for things that have nothing to do with the basis of my, uh, the, the um, authority that I've got as a source um, for you to treat as credible, that wouldn't be relevant. But anything that's going on with me personally that does impact whether I can be treated as an authoritative source, that absolutely would be relevant. Okay, so um, <clears throat> those are some things to point out about how uh, ad hominem works. Um, is this making sense to people? How's it going? Yeah? Connection okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. And um, we've got five minutes left here for our class today. Um, okay, cool. Dang it! I'm sorry that this happened right at right at the end of our journey. I had this bad connection. Um, okay, so and then there's there's also a straw man fallacy, and this one's also really 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 common. Um, the basic idea of straw man is if you imagine you're on one side and you're arguing against 
you know, your opponents, anyone who d disagrees with your conclusion, who disputes your conclusion, is your opponent. If you have a thesis, your opponents are defined by the antithesis, the logical inverse of whatever you're defending. And when you're engaging with them, they're not just going to be one, there's not just going to be one version of someone who would disagree with your conclusion. Oftentimes there's many versions. Or the ways in which that antithesis gets defended could happen in a lot of different ways, right? Like uh, think about diagramming, like lots of independent arguments working toward a conclusion. Straw man fallacy is when I decide to critically engage with only the weakest versions of my opponent's position instead of going and facing off against the strongest ones, the ones that have the, the best potential footing here <clears throat> in terms of disputing my position um, or offering independent reasons in defense of their position. Um, those are who I really should be dealing with. And we talked about this a ton with the Code of Intellectual Conduct through the intellectual virtue of charity. Charity is the antidote to straw man, the straw man fallacy. Um, to avoid that fallacy, the answer is to be charitable to your opponent. In other words, build them up as strong as you possibly can before going after them. And, and the point of, of the straw man fallacy is not to like avoid criticizing things that are obviously bad arguments. Um, you know, the, the straw men are rightfully to be rejected. It's just not uh, doing much to support your position. It, when, in cases where there is actual the opportunity for rational controversy to be banging down weak opponents who can't put, put up any resistance. And again, it's very hard to avoid using examples from this realm for all of these fallacies, but you see this a lot in political discourse where people choose the weakest versions of the opposing position to go after to try to make their anyone who to try to paint with a brush anyone who's in that camp as being as dumb as these people or dumb as these arguments are being offered, something like that. Um, the way in which people find little unfortunate sound bites and then put all this attention on these really weak versions of the position rather than the strongest possible ones. Um, when I've been talking about this uh, like political economic justice stuff with my political philosophy students, really classic examples here are using the example of the USSR as a defeater for communism. Um, Stalinism is not the best example of communism, uh, and or the same way in which, uh, on the flip side, you use um, the modern version of capitalism that exists in our society as the paradigmatic example of what capitalism can be as a social system. Um, personally, uh, just to put some of my cards on the table, uh, for me the jury's out on whether there is an ethical uh, and just version of capitalism that we could be operating with. I think the version that we're operating with right now, the current system, is not just, but is there a version that it, that could be just? Marx thinks capitalism, Karl Marx thinks capitalism is a dying patient um, that has no hope of recovery, that there basically is no way to make this work in a way that is just, and that's just uh, functional. I mean, Marx doesn't even think that it can survive, that it's just going to break down. Um, that a revolution is inevitable. I'm not sure about that either, right? So um, finding uh, the strongest version of your opponent and engaging with that, that's really important. Or like take all the debates that happen around religion. Um, the way in which people who are defending religion uh, try to pick out and pick off the really weak versions of defenses of atheism or cri really bad criticisms of religion that don't take it more seriously that that would be a straw man attack, or the people that attack religion by going after the most absurd, stupid things that happen in the name of it um, as a reason for rejecting the whole thing. Um, those debates are way more productive when they're actually dealing with the strongest possible arguments that can be offered. If you're able to build up your opponent into a really strong version and still defeat it in argument, then you've really accomplished something. Um, if you're just picking off these weak, obviously absurd versions of your opponent's position, you haven't really accomplished anything, and you haven't demonstrated the, uh, that your position is the one that is the most rationally defensible. So straw man attacks are not just, they're kind of like ad hominem. Not only are they kind of unethical or unideal in, in sort of how we treat each other, um, 
I mean, think think about it. Anytime someone has interpreted your position in an uncharitable way and isn't listening to the stronger possible reasons that you might have, that they they twist your position into a, a mockery of what you actually believe. That's really frustrating and disrespectful. You know, you're not really being listened to. So there's ethical baggage with it, but it also doesn't help with truth seeking. Making personal attacks on people, uh, distorting their positions into these weaker versions doesn't really progress our understanding of what makes the most sense or what we should believe is true either. So they're, they're also unproductive. So I wanted to touch on both of those. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I want to give you uh, the other um, part of the code. And the second half is going to be uh, humanity. So you put those together, and that's what you'll get for the quiz. And that's the name of the, the game that I was, uh, that I got, uh, that, that I'm very excited to play over break once, once final grades are all done. <laughs> long, long road before that gets there. But um, does this, uh, the, does the whole thing with the code make sense? I'm hoping. Put those two things together and then, and then you're good. Um, you missed, uh, Okay, so, yeah, uh, so earlier in the lecture, uh, I gave out half of the skeleton key here. So the, the code word is split into two pieces, and you need both pieces. So I gave one piece earlier, and, oh, I don't know, I'm just typing. <laughs> um, I gave one of, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one half of the word, and then I just gave you the second half of the word. And put them together, and that's what you put into the quiz on Canvas. Does that make sense now? No. Uh, oh, oh, I, I, I see what you're saying, uh, Adrian. Yes. Okay, um, this is farewell. I will be hopefully hearing from you sometime down the road, um, but uh, if not, um, it's been nice getting to meet all of you. Um, pray for your safety and health um, and all the sort of complications that are a part of our world right now and uh, that might be a part of your lives. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to be supportive. Um, I definitely don't have a, a limited conception of my job, and I'm. I think about it as like I'm the whole the whole way through in terms of my my job. I think about it in terms of being a a servant to my students, to supporting them, and and just helping you receive benefit, and that relates to the class itself, but also uh, for um, for things that can go outside of that scope as well. So. Um, let me know if there's something, if you want to deal with the more of the informal fallacy curriculum after class is out, uh, that could be a way to do it. If you just want to talk some philosophy with me, I love that. If you want to just have someone to talk to, um, I'm, I'm here and I'll have two weeks of self quarantining before next quarter. So, you know, I'll have time and I'll, I'll love to talk to you. So, um, good luck with everything and, um, yeah, uh, I'll see you later. <laughs>